right, good morning. And uh, happy Mother's Day to all your mothers, as has been said already. Uh, and you online watching, of course, later on, there's a, we have a special kind of gift for the moms. And if you don't come to church, you don't get the gift. So that's just why the action is here, here right? So if you sit at home, no gift for you, no flowers for you from us. And we can't love you, can't bless you in that way. We'll bless you with this service, with this sermon. But, you know, the extra treats, you know, the icing on the cake. Sorry, just moms and women that are present. You get to bless Enjoy that. So that, that'll come up at the end of the, of the service. So we, we honor you. And, and as Pastor Elijah mentioned, um, we understand that Mother's Day is uh, sometimes bittersweet because some of you have lost your mothers or a mother in your life. And you, you know, you t- a day like today, you're just reminded of uh, someone you can't call or someone who's not going to be sitting with you, someone you're not going to be able to celebrate because they're not here anymore. And, and so we, we have recognized that. that that's, that's, that's some, for some, it's, it's maybe the grief or, or of maybe not being able to be a mother for whatever reason. And those, those things that you got to work through and uh, just be sensitive to the singles in your life. All right, I understand that there are people that wish they were mothers and, and so on and so forth. But everyone can be a spiritual mother. If, if you're a woman and you want to influence kids and be invested in other people's lives, you can do that. And, and we, we all have benefited from people like that. And, and, and certainly the church and across history has had these faithful women that have served often without being married or having their own children, but have loved on children. And we'll talk about one of those at the end of this sermon, just so you know, like you, you don't have to bear your own children to have that spiritual influence. And uh, even my wife, who is the number one platinum mom in our lives, um, had an aunt that would, that would spiritually invest in her, a great aunt. Didn't, would, never got married, never had her own kids, but she just took the time to invest in my, my wife and her sister and, and, you know, and write letters and, and pray for them and, and gave us a Bible at our wedding day. We still have that Bible at home. And so, um, you know, there's no reason not that you can't be that, even if you don't have your own family. So, But I want to show you a picture first before we start the sermon, and this is a picture from uh, Central Asia. This is a house that the local church in this city bought for moms and their children. It, um, it's a home. You can see there's stuff outside because they were renovating it. SGA, who I'm, I'm an ambassador for, uh, bought a, a boiler and a new heating system because it blew up. And so they were doing some renovations in this house. And in this home, and I, so we'll go to the next picture there. Um, it's unique in that there's moms and kids that get to stay together in this home. And so if you have been abandoned, if you have been suffering abuse, um, uh, or if you're widowed, there is a place for you to go in this city. The local church has, has multiple of these houses, actually. And this one's specifically for moms and their children. And some of these ch- girls, uh, these children, are actually like teenagers. It's not just little kids. It's actually like even like older moms with older kids can go and, and live in this home. They live together. They support each other. They, they help each other. And, 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 of course, the men in the church were, were fixing up the house and, and painting it and doing all that stuff. And so um, what I want to say is this. Christianity is not just themes, faiths, dogma, doctrine, but it's actual real life, you know, sweat and tears and and, and actual practical help too. It's both. It's not either or. So here's a church in Central Asia. In their culture, if you're a, a widow or a single mom, you're on your own. Good luck. There are not a lot of options for you. And this church says, we are going to make options for these moms. And they bought houses. They put staff in there. Uh, one of the guys that, that helps kind of oversee these houses is a formal, former criminal. He was in prison for 20 years, got saved. And now he's helping vulnerable women and their children uh, in, in this Central Asian country. So it's awesome. The church is doing real stuff, which is what we find in Acts chapter 6. And I'm jumping ahead one section just because Acts 6 has a bunch of moms in it. And so I'm like, well, let's, let's look at that passage, and then we'll go back next week and look at the one we missed. But in Acts 6, we got a bunch of moms, a bunch of women that, that are essential to a problem in the local church in Jerusalem that, that needs to be addressed. And so uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we, we discover some good news and some bad news. Uh, in Acts 6, verse 1, which will be up there, right? it says, in those days... When the disciples were growing in numbers, so that's the good news. The church is growing, potentially 25,000 or more. There's just people upon people upon people that, that are believing in Jesus Christ. The guy who was crucified, 
who was risen, who multiple upon multiple of witnesses would attest to. And then they're seeing this transformation in this group called the church in Jerusalem where they're the followers of Jesus. And they're like, man, these people got something. And then more people keep joining this movement. And, and it's awesome. But you and I both know that growth creates challenges, especially families, right? You want to grow your family so you have the first child, which is really fun, like exciting. Yay, we have a baby. And then you realize, oh, now we have a baby. You know, it, it, it fills this diaper every three hours and it, you know, and it spits up and it pukes and it does, you know, and, and then you suddenly, okay, so this is awesome growth, but then challenges. Then you had another baby and it's like, oh, more challenges. And then a third baby, like, oh, outnumbered, you know? And, and so this is the reality. Growth creates challenges. You guys in businessmen, you know this and women. Your business grows, you have a couple employees, and you add a few more, a few more, the business grows, and suddenly you have like 10 employees, 12, and you're like, I can't manage 10 by myself, and you gotta hire another manager, and, and it creates just complexity and difficulty, and that is happening in the church. It's growing. Uh, more people are coming to know Jesus, but with that also, there's more needs that need to be met. And we find the bad news is that a complaint arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebraic Jews because their widows are being overlooked on the daily distribution of food. So understand we've got these widows. First century, there are no social programs for widows. Well, the Jews had their own social program, but obviously people that became Christians maybe got kicked out of that program, and now the church is looking after these widows. And, and there's this complaint. Now, you, you know, it kind of makes the hair on your back of your head go up. You think about complaint. You think about complainers. You think about whiners. Um, the word is an onomatopoeia. It's like the word murmur. It sounds like it is. You know, murmur, murmur. Like they, there's this going on in the background, right? You're like, complaint. This could be dangerous. Complaints can grow into bigger problems, can grow into division, um, the ending of relationships, the, you know, Set, moving apart of people from one another. It has a great, great potential for danger in the Old Testament. When God moves his people out of Egypt into Israel, as they move into, or into the promised land, as they're moving towards the promised land, <clears throat> they begin to complain, to murmur. It's a similar idea, similar terms, similar concepts. Like, so, so back then they did it, and it always ended disastrously for them. And here we are, early church, a problem's coming. There's murmuring, there's complaining. You're like, oh no, are we heading in the same direction that the Israelites went, but, but, but maybe not. Well, can the Holy Spirit make a difference in this situation? Will the church fail like Israel did, or will they do it differently? There are legitimate complaints, though. There are times when it's okay to complain. Um, like locally. Some people have loved ones in some of the care homes and healthcare situations here in, in our region. And, and I've heard from many of them from our church and outside. Uh, one of the guys that from a different church told me that, yeah, my, my wife's in this home and like they never have enough staff. They're always, they're understaffed, they're understaffed. And we've heard that where, where we have family and, and, you know, and I've heard, you know, people getting shoved in the hallway in the hospital or, or here or in Edmonton or whatever. And so you hear these stories and someone needs to advocate for these people for our loved ones. Sometimes they don't even have their own physical voice. We need to advocate. And sometimes it's hard, it's difficult, it's not, it's, it's not easy, but if you're not advocating for them, who will? And that's what we have here. It's like, there's something happening here and someone needs to speak up for these widows. Obviously, what we have in Jerusalem is all these Jewish people, some of them have moved in from other parts of the Roman world because it was advantageous in Jewish thinking to die in Jerusalem and be buried there. So they've moved, probably left their kids and grandkids behind in order to die in the holy city. Well, their husbands probably went first, and there they are. They don't have extended family. They're vulnerable. Who's looking after them? Because the Hebraic Jews had all their relatives locally. But these Hellenistic Jews from the Greek world, Greek-speaking world, don't have loved ones close by. And as the church is growing, the need is growing. And, and suddenly it's really hard to keep track of all these widows. Again, very vulnerable position in the first century. What do, what do we do? And, and so, so here's this complaint, and, and, it's, and it's got this, ten, this potential to divide the church. Today, guess what would happen? We'd start a, a Hebraic church and we'd start a Hellenistic church, right? And our own denomination and we'd look after our own and, we, you know, and, we, and then they, they would split and then they would split and that's what's happened in the history of the church. But here is a potential for division, for divide and what is going to happen because it's a legitimate concern. 
these widows should be fed. Luke doesn't attach blame to anyone. But he just says, this is a concern. And he leads us to see what are they going to do to address this growth challenge, these poor widows being overlooked. You know, the challenge is we do tend to segregate and separate as humans, fallen human creatures, uh, not walking in God's way. That The natural thing for us to do is to find a group of people that we attach ourselves to and, and feel better than other group of people, right? That, that's, that's the natural way in a sinful soul to do that. But what the Holy Spirit and what Jesus wants to do is to bring us together from a diversity of backgrounds into one family, into one unit, right? So you understand that. We, Lisa and I were in New Orleans. Um, she had this credit that we had to use up by a certain point. So I called the travel person and said, hey, where's the cheapest place I could fly? And they said, New Orleans. And so I'm like, okay, we'll go to New Orleans. I wouldn't go there again, but it was, it was you know, and I, there was a seminary there that we could stay at. So I had cheap accommodations, cheap flight. Um, and, and we got to see depravity at its best in New Orleans. But we went outside of New Orleans to a, um, a plantation, you know, like a slavery plantation, you know, where they had slaves and, and a big, you know, the big mansion where the owner lived and then these little chicken coops where the slaves lived. And uh, it's, it's kind of weird just seeing that, you know, I mean, it, as a Canadian and all that stuff. But um, we're, we're there and, and, and then they're talking about like the slaves. And here are all these slaves, and he's like, even within the slaves, there was this kind of class system. If you were from the Caribbean, you were, uh, you know, uh, considered better than the slaves from Africa. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, you're all slaves. Like, you guys should be sticking together. But even the, the Caribbean slaves would look down upon the African slaves. And I'm like, come on, you guys. Why do we do this? Calvin Miller, one of the guys that taught me when I was doing my, my work in Dallas there, said he was in Mexico, and it was like this slum. And people like crates that they kind of put together into houses. And this one crate had this wire kind of coming, this single wire that went into the thing. And, and they had electricity. And the missionary was said to Calvin Miller, like, those people there don't even talk to their neighbors because they feel like they're better than them because they have power going into their little, you know, crate, you know. And so we do this. This is, this is natural human tendency. We tend to, you know, segregate ourselves, you know, isolate, classify ourselves. And this is the potential to happen here in the early church. But that's not what God wants. That's not what the Holy Spirit is creating. It's, it's sort of these different, you know, here's a rich church, here's a poor church, here's a blue collar church, here's a white collar church, you know, here's a brown church, here's a white church. Here's a, I mean, God doesn't want that. He's bringing us together into one family. It was the scandal of the first century, you know, in Roman culture that slaves were eating with, you know, nobility, we're eating, you know, with, with you know, with colored people, with this, with that, and with all these different backgrounds, and they, they, they were all in one body, they were serving each other, and the, Rome, the Roman culture was like, what is going on here? The church was going on here. So what do they do? Verse 2, it tells us. So the 12 called the whole group of the disciples together. Everyone. They didn't have a secret meeting with just a few of the Hebraic guys or the few of the Hellenists. They brought. They just let's let's shine the light into this hole and see what we can see. Let's identify the problem and let's let's think about solutions, right? Because because we just need to like the elephant is in the closet. Let's pull it out. Here it is. Let's deal with it instead of doing little backdoor meetings. Here they are, everyone together, and they said it's not right for us to neglect the word of God to wait on tables. Um, that idea of, of serve tables is not just like wiping, you know, coffee stain off the, off the, off the counter. It, it's actually, it could be understood as like taking the money in, counting the money, distributing the money to those people that are buying food. Like, like it, it, the table could be the, the counting table here as well as, as, the, as the food table. It's like we've been given this commission to to preach the word of God. And we are the apostles. We walked with Jesus. So, so we're giving people the goods, the foundation of the faith. And now there's this practical need. We recognize it's a need, but, but we have this commission given to us. So, so, so it's, it's not right for us to, to drop this in order to do this. Um, it's temptation for us pastors all the time to take on jobs that we shouldn't be doing because someone needs to do it. And they're saying, look, um, we, we can't give up what we've been doing. But he says in verse 3, but carefully select from among you brothers 
Seven men who are well attested, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this necessary task. We got a solution. You choose some guys to help us out. Here's the qualifications. You see, there's moral qualifications. There's spiritual qualifications. There's practical qualifications. They they need to be well attested. Uh, They need to have a good reputation in the community. People need to know that these men are honest, fair, you know, trustworthy. They also need to be men that have demonstrated that, that, that they are under the direction and the control of the Holy Spirit. They're not doing their own thing. They're committed to doing God's will. And not only that, they have to be wise men. You know, they're not into pyramid schemes and get-rich-quick scams. They're they're, they're legit workers. You know, they're doing the right thing. They're they're, they're looking after, and and they're responsible. They they can take the responsibility of this off of our shoulders. Um, They didn't tell them to shut up. They didn't tell them, well, you know what, we're going to form a committee. A focus group, and we're going to talk about this. You know, and we're going to we're going to have a commission that, that travels all around Jerusalem and getting getting information, and then we'll, they'll bring us a report. We'll we'll hire an outside consultant, which will which will review and figure out what. To, I mean, this is what governments would do, right? There would be lots and lots of paperwork and money spent, and and no action. My friend Sammy is from Haiti. He'll come and preach here this summer. Hopefully, you'll get to meet him. Um, you know, he talked about all the money that went to Haiti after the earthquake, and none of it came to his community, zero. You think you're giving money to Haiti, he's like, we never saw a dime or anything in my community. It's going somewhere. Uh, foundations and people are, are, are flying back and forth, and there's all sorts of stuff happening, but his family and his neighborhood got nothing. Uh, this is what the world does. This is, this is secular solutions. Let's create a lot of activity, a lot of paperwork, a lot of projects, but the people are still starving on the ground. Here, the apostles, this is simple. Here's what we need. We need seven guys that can just take this load off our shoulders. Here's the qualifications. We will appoint them, but you pick them. And we'll, we'll you know, so, so you, you, you can present them, and then we'll, we'll give them the final commissioning, and, and we'll take care of this need. What needed to happen was an expansion of leadership and responsibility. The, the apostles were the bottleneck, and they needed more people to help so they could focus on the essential task. You see what it says in verse 4. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And this is, you know, the, the reality is, is that we, um, you know, we all have a ministry. We'll talk about that later. And for the apostles, this, this was what was needed for them at that time. But they're saying, yeah, but, but we still care about these widows. Absolutely, but we just don't have the time to, to do this and this. So choose seven and we'll give them that task and we'll carry on with this task. But sometimes, you know, challenges can help us to stay focused on what is really essential. Don't look as a challenge as, oh, this is awful. Sometimes the, those difficulties in life kind of refine our, our, our perspective. I don't know if you've ever had a, a challenge or... I can remember going and I did a funeral for a little, a little guy, like four years old, horrible. Um, just a tiny casket, like those are awful funerals to do. Um, and you come home and you just see your own son that's the same age and you just hug him and squish him and <laughs> just don't wanna let him go and just realize, yeah man, God's blessed me. I could be that family today. And sometimes those difficulties in life refine you. You know, when you have that cancer scare or, or some health situation or, or you almost lose a kid or, you, you know, or whatever the case may be, then you come back and you realize, what is important to me? Who, who's reaching out to me in my crisis? Is my work, the guys that I, I sacrificed my whole life for, are they looking out for me sometimes, but most of the time not? If you're not making them money, you're not useful to them, but, but other people are looking out for you and, and, and sometimes these difficulties do refine us to see what is really important. And on a day like Mother's Day, I'm gonna say, family is important. It's more important than your work. And you can balance that, but just understand if work is squeezing family, then it's time to make a change. God wants your family to be a priority in your life. If work is squeezing out your spiritual life, it's time to make a change because God wants that to be a priority in your life. Understand this. Um, we will devote ourselves to ministry, to prayer, and the ministry of the word. And the same term is used to describe the service of tables as the service of the word. It's the same word. 
It's not like prayer in the word is higher than serving tables. It's like we're both doing the Lord's work, but our calling is this, and we need a group of guys that's calling is this. So in verse 5, we find out they, the proposal pleased the entire group. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, with Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a Gentile convert to Judaism from Antioch. You see the local church leadership is growing. And what you'll notice about all those names, none of those are Hebraic names. No Abraham there. No Isaac, no Jacob. You notice that? They're Greek names. They've expanded the leadership. And of course, and then there's this Gentile guy in the mix too. The church is growing, the leadership is growing, including this Gentile, and the needs will get met as the leadership expands. These guys are not deacons per se. I mean, the the, the text is not saying that. They're they're doing a service. What we'll find out is that Philip and, and Stephen are both preachers and evangelists and sharing the gospel. So they're not just table money counters. Like like they they are spiritual men who can be entrusted with this responsibility of looking after the people that feed the widows, as well as doing practical ministry of sharing the gospel, sharing the ministry of the word. And that's what we find with Philip and with Stephen. So so understand that this is a broader leadership than that. But but what the apostles are saying, we can't do everything. You know. It's kind of like what I experienced these last couple of weeks um, when I found out that, oh, someone wants to give us a playground. And then I'm like, I don't know how to get a playground from there to here. But thankfully, there was a group of people here, a big group that, that pitched in to help to take it apart. And then Steve was pulling the stuff out of the ground and bring them over here. And, and this group of people that had the equipment, the knowledge, the know-how to make this happen helped me. Why? Because I don't know how to make this happen. And this, another group is going to help us put it back together. Yay! In a, in, a, in a few weeks, you know, hopefully, whatever. So, so understand, but this is how the church works. We can fill in and, and compliment and help each other. And here's a group of guys set apart to do the Lord's service. It says in verse 6, They stood these men before the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. So they're chosen, they're, they're identified, they're nominated, and then the apostles are the spiritual leaders in the, in, the, in the place. So yeah, these are good men. We give them this responsibility. And the result is in verse 7, that the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Even a group of religious people were like, oh, this is, this is crazy. Look what's happening here. This, this movement's growing. They're, they're looking after their widows. They're looking after Hellenistic widows and Hebrew widows, and, 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 and the, the movement keeps moving. We don't hear about this situation again after this. It's dealt with. It's done. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. It begins with the group growing and it ends with the group growing. In the middle is this conflict, which all of us, you know, face conflicts in life and difficulties and challenges. Some of you grew up in homes that didn't deal with conflict, right? So, so something happened and everyone just pretended it didn't happen and everyone went moving on. But, but you know, you're wearing the, the scars and the, and the bruises and, and the, you know, the, the, just the, the, the backsplash of that conflict and you're kind of carrying it with you. But no one's talking about what happened. And, 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 and some adults grow into adulthood into their own families and they bring some of that stuff with them because they, they just never knew how to deal with conflict. And here in the book of Acts, in the early church, God's giving us a picture of a bunch of people with a real problem who find a God-honoring solution and his ministry, his work keeps moving in spite of all the dangers that occurred. I mean, this could have gone any number of directions, but because the Holy Spirit was guiding them, because they were looking at the interests of Christ above their own interests, because they, they took it seriously and they opened up the floor for people to get involved, they were able to solve this problem and look after the vulnerable and the needy in their congregation. And God says, you know what? Like, we have this ministry of sharing the gospel, but we also have this ministry of caring for each other, looking after each other, of, of being aware of each other. And it's not either or. Some churches are all about this and they forget about this. And some churches are all about this and they forget it. You know, so, but it, it's both and. He's like, yeah, we're going to keep the ministry of the prayer and the word, but we're also going to feed widows and look after vulnerable people. One of the guys in our men's group said, hey, guys, let, let's make sure we don't forget about the single moms in our church and their kids. We need to look after them. And he's right. 
They're our responsibility. What about the older women that, that, are, that are widowed or, you know, single? We need to be caring for them. And, and we do, and I, I see it happening. But, but this is our calling. It's like, yeah, we're going to need to share the gospel with everyone we can. But we also need to look after the people in our church that, that need help and in our community. So there's a balance there as we think about that. So I have a few lessons here. Uh, you can track with me if you want to write it down. You don't have to, but there it is. Jesus continually attracts people to believe in and follow him. This movement is an organic movement that's in that's intended to continually grow. Um, the church is not intended to be this static space where, okay, we got 30 people, we look at each other every week for 30 years, and then we all die, and we shut the building down and sell it to a, a cafe or someone who wants to start an a Airbnb. And then, and then that's, that's not the church. The church is this dynamic thing that's this organism that's supposed to keep growing and growing and growing, and it has grown. And we're, we're, here we are 2,000 years later. We're, 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 the, we're the, the offshoot of this. But it, it is intended to grow. The good news about Jesus is, is an exciting message. You can have new life through Jesus Christ, which brings you into a relationship with God, which lasts forever and ever. Awesome. Why wouldn't you want to share that? Some people receive it, some people don't, but we need to share it with everyone we can. So this thing just keeps moving, and we are a part of that today. Number two, God can and will help us navigate the problems and challenges we encounter. You're not on your own when you face difficulties. God is there to help, and hopefully the church is there to help. And what I said in the first service, I'm going to say again, like, if you're having problems in your marriage, like, come talk to us. We want to help you. Um, the challenge sometimes is by the time you come, uh, you, you've run each other over so many times that one or both of you are already halfway out the door and, and you're setting up this SOS flag, but it, it's too, like it, you guys have just been spitting at each other and throwing rocks at each other for two years and it's, it's impossible to fix that situation. And, 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 you know, but if you get to us early and say, man, we just are struggling to find the same wavelength. It's like I'm on FM, he's on AM and we're not even able, like well, we can help you with that. We want to help you with that. So get us in on it early. It's okay to, to have some communication issues and conflict issues and, and, and need some, some coaching. Good. We don't mind coaching. You, there is not a perfect marriage in this church. Not one. Every couple in this church fights. Uh, some do it publicly. Some do it privately. But all of us fight. I mean, so, so it's okay. And sometimes you need help. How, how, how do I have a fair fight? Well, we can give you some tools. So, so, but God can help you. And he uses the church to help us navigate the problems and challenges we encounter. If you're struggling, even personally, um, reach out to someone. Uh, we we, we want to help. I mean, we, we've been through some dark valleys as a church together where, where people made some decisions that we wish they wouldn't have, and, and, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, no matter how dark it's getting, just, there, there are people here that want to be sunshine in your darkness. They, they don't care about the, the cloud and the rain. They, they want to just walk with you in that. And they're there for you. And I know the men, the group, men's group, the women, the women's group, and the small groups, like, like, it's all like that. You don't have to have it all lined up and, and, and together. You can be a mess, and that's fine. But, but don't be a mess in your own, in a, in a closet, lock yourself in and make stupid decisions. Let us help you. God can and will help us navigate the problems and challenges we encounter. You're not alone here in New Life, unless you choose to be. And we want to be there for each other. Number three, uh, we need spiritual leaders today to maintain mission and mercy. Like this is the important responsibility of, of the pastors, the board, the, the staff team here, and the ministry team is like, we are, we are passionate about sharing the good news so that you can move up and out in new life in Jesus Christ, but we're also going to care for each other and minister to, to practical needs at the same time. And that is the responsibility of spiritual leaders. You know, like I'm talking about the care homes in our community. Uh, and it's not the frontline worker that that's the issue there. It's whoever's booking people into, into, into the schedule. Someone up the ladder is not doing their job, right? I mean, if, if you need six people on the floor and there's only four, well, who, someone up here. And if, if they're not given the, the, the freedom to hire six people, then it's the person above them. Like, like you just got to climb the ladder and you find someone is going to be responsible. But what we find is a lot of times in life, you, you can never find the responsible person. Everyone just keeps passing the buck. But here in the church, we don't live like that. We're like, no, we are responsible to God for one another. And, we're, and the, the apostle said, yeah, you know what? We got to look after our widows. And we will through additional leadership. We need, as we grow, we're going to need more spiritual leaders. What I look for in a spiritual leader is a man who's serving currently in the church, a man who's faithful to his wife and to his family, a man who is, has a consistent walk with the Lord, reads the Bible every day and prays, 
a man who makes good, wise choices, who's willing to read a couple books and, and have honest conversations with me about what he's learning. Um, and any of you are welcome to join me on that journey. Um, that's what we need, spiritual leaders. And it's going to take years, uh, uh, sometimes months, years to develop that, but that, that's the trajectory I wish that all of our men would be on. Some of them will move into le- spiritual leadership, some of them won't, but all of us will s- grow spiritually as a result of doing that. And so that's, that's our, our passion, that we would have men that are like, yeah, we, we care, we take responsibility for our homes, for this church, for everyone in this church. And that's um, awesome. Okay, number four. Everyone has a ministry in church. And our roles are designed to complement each other and not to compete with one another. It's a team. All of us have a role. And it was awesome seeing men and women get power tools out and take a playground apart. <laughs> like they're doing a role that, that I'm not very good at or knowledgeable about, but there they were <laughs> engineers, construction workers, electricians, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of people, you know, mechanics there, they're just ripping this thing apart. And it was awesome. This, this is great. You can go downstairs and watch, you know, experts downstairs working with kids. They're fantastic. We got a great team and, and there's others making great coffee and, and everyone's got a role making meals, doing, you know, everyone has a ministry. If you aren't serving somewhere, serving someone, then you're missing out. And you're kind of like this Achilles in my foot here that's not really functioning. It's throwing the rest of my body off. I have this dumb boot and this, all this reality that I'm in right now, right? When, when, when there's an inactive part of the body, the rest of the body it, it has to compensate for that part, right? And, you know, I'm hobbling around and, you know, it, it's not natural. It doesn't even look good. It looks, it looks, you know, scary, right? So here it is. God invites you to be involved. And for most of you, it's not going to be up here. So you don't have to worry. I'm not going to make you preach. Yeah, I have high qualifications to get up into this place. But it will be somewhere where I can't do it. And we've served together side by side. And, and I invite you to, to find your place, your fit here at New Life. Um, I'd love to see a group of people that would just visit seniors that don't get visitors in our community, in our city. But I don't want to be the one organizing it. I need someone that can organize that too. That would we'll just say, yeah, you know what? Let's make sure everyone that lives in our city, in these homes, some of them don't see a guest for six months at a time, would have someone that would come in at least every month and just sit and have tea with them and talk to them, listen to them. We could do that. You could do that if that's your calling, your ministry. Number five, healthy churches with spiritual leadership will be growing churches. There'll be churches that can work through problems and not divide over it, but actually get stronger as a result. Um, the enemy would love to divide this church and every church in our community. And he has been successful in the past at doing that. We don't want to give him a foothold here. I don't want to see him do it anywhere else. I pray for my brothers and sisters in town as I pray for our own church. I want every church in our city to be full uh, with people discovering Jesus and growing in Jesus, right? And so, uh, but, you know, this is what we want. And and we're not afraid of conflict. It's okay. In your marriage, you shouldn't be afraid of conflict. You should just learn how to manage conflict in a healthy, God-honoring way, right? So this is what what we want to be. And so so I end with this lady here. I have a picture there. Um, Amy Carmichael, this Irish girl who... um, early on in her life had this interesting experience. I'm going to read it from 10 people. Every Christian should know. This is Warren Wiersbe book. He talks about Amy Carmichael's early life experience. It was Sunday morning and Mrs. Carmichael and the children were returning home from church. They met a poor, pathetic old woman who was burdened with a heavy bundle. Instantly, Amy and her two brothers relieved the woman of her bundle, took her arms, and helped her along. At first, the icy stares of the proper Presbyterians embarrassed them, but then the Lord moved in, and the whole scene changed. Into Amy's mind flashed Paul's words from 1 Corinthians 3 about gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. The fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. In later years, Amy wrote, What went on? I said nothing to anyone, but I knew that something had happened that had changed life's values. Nothing could ever matter again but the things that were Eternal. They were just helping an old lady. And all these pious people walking home from church are like looking down their nose at her because they're helping her with this dirty bundle. And, but inside, she's like, this, there's something more to life. So she ends up in India on the late 1800s. 
And she shows up at this mission compound and she meets all these missionaries and like none of them have seen a single convert. And she's like, well, what are you doing here? Like, is this not about sharing the gospel? Like, what, what's going on here? You know, and so she begins, you know, just sharing Jesus and, and she, she discovers in the culture that there's this, 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 um, this horrible darkness where, where they, people would sell their daughters and their sons to these temples and they'd be used as slaves for all sorts of horrible things and to get their money for their family. And she's like, this is awful. Why, why is this happening? And, and and, and she's praying about this, and she's praying about this. And finally, in uh, March 1901, a seven-year-old girl named Prina flees the temple and comes to Amy Carmichael, where she's living. And Amy, and she adopts Amy as her mother. <laughs> Amy, the single, single woman, never married, never had her own kids, becomes a mother in that moment. And a few months later, uh, another child, and then another, and pretty soon she's got 18 girls, and then, you know, then she's building a, a compound where she can house these children, where they can, where they can save them from this horrible reality, and, 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 and at its peak, her ministry there had 900 children, boys' houses, girls' houses, saved from this horrible reality. We are in Wearsby, we would say. She was especially careful about selecting workers. There was one reason for the no salary policy. Most, many Indian, Indians would have gladly been baptized and worked for the mission in order to make a living. Guard your gate was one of her favorite warnings, and she heeded it herself. Some of her friends and supporters often were surprised when she rejected applicants who, to them, seemed idly suited for the ministry. But later events always proved her right. She prayed men and women into places of service, trusting the Lord to prepare them, provide for them, and protect them. Protection was especially important, not only because of the Indian climate and unsanitary conditions, but even more because of the idolatry and demonism. Satan and his armies attacked the people in the ministry at Don Haver in ways that make the, these experiences read like events from the book of Acts. The secret of victory, the word of God and prayer. Isn't that interesting? The word of God and prayer. So here's a woman, a single woman, who's become ama, mother to, to all these, you know, poor kids leaving these temples. But she would say, yeah, I was looking after those kids, but the secret, the word of God in prayer. So you see, both are going on at the same time. I have a next picture here. Here's, here's uh, Amy with, with some of, of, of the kids in one of her homes. She didn't let not being a biological mother stop her from being a mother. She sought to share the good news of Jesus Christ as she could, but she also looked after the vulnerable, the weak, and those who had no one speaking out on their behalf. She was Jesus in that community at that time. And that's what we all can do in the places where God has put us and the needs that we become aware of that are around us. Sometimes people see needs and then they come talk to me or Elijah and like, hey, there's a need. But the reason God brought that need to your attention is because he wants you to be part of that solution. Uh, God's not saying, okay, go tell Pastor Mike to do this. He's, he's saying, hey, you, go to your bank, take some money out, go get your car, help that person, go fix that fence for that mom or, or fix her brakes or do something. Like, he's asking you, if he's bringing that attention, need to your attention, he's asking you to be part of the solution. And that's scary, but he will always provide the resources for you to do that. And he did that with, with Amy Carmichael. And there's any innumerable stories like this of men and women that just stood up to help people that were vulnerable, that were, you know, isolated, that, that didn't have anyone else speaking for them. And, and God always provides. And he's like, here, church, is your opportunity to show the world what the difference Jesus Christ makes. Would you be a part of that with me? as we seek to live out the life of Jesus here at New Life Community Church. I'm going to invite the team up. They're going to lead us in a closing song. Um, if you don't know Jesus, none of this stuff really makes sense. And I invite you to believe in Jesus Christ and, and commit, you know, and just follow him and commit your life to him, surrender to him today. Um, and then join this movement where we pray, where we share the good news, and then where we care and, and help and, and reach out to one another. It's a beautiful thing. And as you do both those realities together, like you grow and you discover a purpose outside of yourself. If you're just living in your own little universe, you'll find that it's pretty narrow and it's not satisfying. But when you join God's kingdom, it opens up a whole, whole new opportunity, a whole new purpose, a whole new meaning. And God wants all of you to experience the blessing of that.
even today. Would you pray with me, Lord? Lord, we thank you that you helped your church through this difficult time, that you gave them wisdom and that you provided the leadership so they could continue to grow and to share and to care and do everything that you called them to do. And, and I pray that for new life, Lord. Raise up spiritual leaders in our church, men that could function in the board, uh, men and women that could serve in ministries and, and, and lead and care for each other. Help us, Lord. I do thank you for all the men and women that do serve here in our church in the finances and with the children and with the hospitality and care groups and men's group and women's group. Lord, Lord, there, you've, you've, you've blessed us in so many ways, but I pray you continue to raise up leaders. Open our eyes to see the needs around us as individuals and as a church. Help us to continue to share the life-giving message of Jesus Christ to our community, but also to provide practical support where we can, how we can, wherever you would determine for us to do that, Lord. And this week, Lord, if there's someone we can help, may we be just obedient to your Holy Spirit as he nudges us in that direction. Thank you for the story and for your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with the team as we sing?